Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. Uh, I'm Peter Whittle. Uh, just wanted to say before I introduce my guest this week that I uh, want to say a great thank you uh, to you for continuing to subscribe in such numbers every day. Uh, it goes up. Uh, that's great news. We're hugely appreciative of it and indeed of the donations that you send. Um, enormously helpful to us and vital in fact. And so thank you very much for that. Um, my guest this week was last on the program in December, uh, got huge views, and then uh, was taken down by YouTube. So let's see how we get on this week uh, with Peter Hitchens. I'm delighted he's with us today. Uh, Peter, obviously, columnist for The Mail on Sunday, and also an author of numerous books, and uh, is very well known to you all. Uh, Peter, um, thank you for coming again. And um, I hope that we stay up longer this time. Well, that's so sorry. I can feel even now somebody <laughs> poised over his <laughs> algorithm machine to try and make sure that as few of people as possible ever get to see this. Yeah. Watch it quickly, everybody. Don't, don't hang around. You never know that's right. how long you've got. That's right. I want to start. There's actually a, a, a theme to that segue, in fact, in a way, when we think about it. Um, but... Um, this is going out on Sunday. Now, last week, we had uh, the May Day bank holiday. And you pointed out that you were at the, uh, on social media, on your Twitter feed, that you were at the, I believe, the last May Day um, parade in Moscow would have been in 1990? 1991, the last, the last Soviet um May Day. I was at the, the last Revolution Day in the previous November of 1990, and the, the last Soviet May Day, just about Soviet. It was a bit chaotic and a mess, but they were still they were still trying to hold the Soviet Union together. It collapsed, if you remember, after a, a, a drunken, unsuccessful putsch in August 1991, yeah. and the whole thing ended. But I managed to see both of the last two, and as a as a accredited. Western correspondent, you got quite a good, you didn't get a seat, but you got to stand quite close to Lenin's tomb while the parades went by. It was an enthralling. Were you just there for that moment or were you, because you, you were in... Uh, I, was, I was living in Moscow yeah. from June 1990 till October 92. And can you give us an impression of what it was like, you know, the, the, the time? Well, it was the end. It was obviously the end. Uh, they were they, they were taking everything down. Even when I arrived in in June of of 1990, uh, the, the symbols of of Soviet power uh, were the the great big hammers and sickles all over everything were being were being removed. I saw them being carted off uh, in such scruffiness hunks of grey metal. The building in which I lived, uh, which I shouldn't have been living in. Uh, had once contained Leonid Brezhnev and his family and Yuri Andropov. Uh, the plaque commemorating Brezhnev's tenancy there had been removed a few months before I got there, but the Yuri Andropov one was still there. The Nothing was really working. Uh, command economies work really when you've got enough terror. And the problem was that the terror had pretty much collapsed and indeed at general levels of fear had collapsed. The party was still technically in control but everything was coming to bits. I remember going to a great congress in the, the hideous modern congress hall inside the Kremlin and seeing a, a, a Soviet admiral going along the buffet with his briefcase, scooping up hors d'oeuvre and dropping it with his briefcase to take them home. <laughs> it had come to that. And they all knew it was over, I think, but it, it took some time for it actually to happen. And it was a complicated end. You know, no one, I think, would have predicted exactly what form it would take, but the last, the last Revolution Day with the, with, the, with the Red Army and the tanks and the missiles, I, I saw, and the last May Day, which was a bit more balloony and, uh, and supposedly festive. The, the May in Moscow is actually quite chilly. Uh, I also saw. I've still got the passes. Was it a surprise to you what happened then? Well, not really. I'd been sent there by by uh, an editor who was hoping that that I would be there to see it collapse and. Uh, and that's fundamentally what I was there for, to be there when it collapsed. And by luck rather than judgment, I actually was there when it yeah. collapsed. I, the, when the putsch happened, the tanks came up my street. Uh, I walked out, having having heard on the radio that Mikhail Gorbachev was ill, supposedly, which he of course wasn't. 
And for a moment, I believed it. And then I thought, no, of course not. It's yeah, not ill. Yeah. I walked out in the street and the tanks were coming up the street in the slanting August sunlight. It's rather beautiful, actually, surprisingly so. But if you had gone back, say, 10 years, would you have thought that the Soviet Union would be collapsing in a decade? Oh, no, 10 years, I don't think I'd have had a clue. Uh, but I had been spending quite a lot of time in the other Eastern European countries from about 1988 onwards. And you could feel a strong sense it was there. And the, really the most obvious place where it was coming to an end was East Germany, mm. where it, quite amusingly, the, the, the reading room in the Soviet embassy on the Inter den Linden was off limits to East German citizens because the stuff on display was much too radical and too anti-communist for them. They, they, and again, I, I went to a visit that Mikhail Gorbachev made to Prague, uh, which I think would have been in the I think that was April 89, but I wouldn't absolutely swear to it. And it was, again, obvious that he was seen by the people in Prague as the potential savior from, a, from their own Czech regime. The, all, the, all the Warsaw Pact regimes, possibly with the exception of Hungary and Poland, had, had become more hardline than the, than the Kremlin by then and were, t- were terrified that the Kremlin would pull the rug out from under them. So you could see it coming, mm. though I don't think anybody would have said it would have happened so fast mm. or so dramatically or that the, the, the disintegration of Soviet power would be so complete. And I went down in the summer, uh, summer of 92 before I left to Sevastopol, which was, had been up till then a closed city, foreigners couldn't get into it. And all the creeks and inlets around the naval base were full of scuttled warships. Yeah. Uh, actually, actually the, 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 someone pulled the plug, they were, mm. they were half sunk. Uh, I, w- I wish I had pictures of it, I had no camera. They, they, they were, the next time I went, they'd long ago been, been sold off for scrap and turned into washing machines and razor blades, but they were actually there, this, the whole project Mm. of the global Soviet Navy had been abandoned in a very, very short period. It's often sort of said that if you take this as being the end of the Cold War, you know, for sh- argument's sake, um, that we had no victory parade for the end of the Cold War. So therefore, it, was, it basically was allowed to sort of simmer on ideologically speaking. Well, I don't know about that. Do you think? Uh, there were a lot of pronouncements of victory and a lot of actions of deliberate humiliation mm. of the, the Russians and the Soviet Union. I mean, the dismantling of the Soviet Union was uh, was 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 done in a, in a way which was deeply humiliating to Russia and Russians, and you could tell that they felt that way. Mm. Uh, so they certainly felt that we'd uh, we'd not exactly shown magnanimity in victory. And then the the other thing which happened, which, which to this day, few people understand, is that the fall of the Berlin Wall released the, the West and left from a terrible restraint which had been on them. Up till then, they had been, whether they liked it or not, the defenders of, the mm. sympathizers with, ultimately, of something which had to keep its own people in with a concrete and barbed wire barrier. When that was over, they had had a huge propaganda victory. They simply were not the enemy anymore. And the, in, in my view, the rebirth of the Western European left, which had begun in 68, uh, took off after 89 because suddenly they no longer had that great albatross of the Berlin Wall around their necks. When you were uh, a Marxist, was it an albatross? Did you feel that? Well, I was, I, that's why I was a Trotskyist. The whole Trotskyist. point about Trotskyism is it disclaims to a greater or lesser extent, responsibility for the Soviet disaster. My particular brand of Trotskyism, if you're interested in this this minute theology, the International Socialists, as they were then called, referred to the Soviet Union as state capitalist. We didn't even acknowledge that it was in any way a socialist country. We said the whole thing was was a, a complete failure economically and politically, and we weren't going to make any apologies for it. And our slogan was neither Washington nor Moscow, but international socialism. I, I think this was quite cheap and cowardly, a refusal to take responsibility for the results of our own ideas. But we, we, we did actually disown it. But the, the main currents of communism, and even some Trotskyists, still ultimately believed in the defense of the Soviet Union as, as something they felt they had to do.
Mm. You said recently uh, that uh, you were a Trotskyist, but you said that Marxism, actually, I don't want to misquote you, so I've, I've written it down. Don't let it worry you, everybody else does. <laughs> Most people who have encountered Marxism as a way of thinking will continue to be influenced by it. I think it's often the key to understanding politics. Um, why is that? Well, it's partly, I suppose it's a modern Machiavellianism. It's very hard as a set of attitudes, very realistic set of attitudes towards the exercise of power, how it's to be done, how other people will do it to you. Uh, it's extremely realistic about that. Uh, and it, although in, in, in some cases it's crude materialism is, is, is too coarse and brutal a weapon to be used in sophisticated policies, quite a lot of the time it works. Uh, it, it also teaches you a, a lot about the nature of ruthlessness. And Lenin was the most ruthless politician who ever lived, and the one who had the shortest distance between thought and action. And if you're in serious politics and you need to strike hard and strike fast, which everybody does at some point if they want to get what they want, then any sort of learning training is going to be helpful to you in doing this. I think the most obvious example of this in modern British politics was Dennis Healy, an extremely effective politician, mm. uh, witty, uh, realistic, uh, convincing, persuasive, but ultimately one could tell when one was dealing with him, someone who had a lot of thought behind what he was doing. He had the, the complete Marxist training and, uh, and it showed, and it put him in some ways way in front of a lot of his Labour Party colleagues, and it, it, he could make mincemeat out of most Tories because he simply understood the world mm -hmm. as it really is mm -hmm. better. It, 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 Marxism may be utopian, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not sentimental. Mm. You've said as well, I think you, when we interviewed you before actually, that, uh, that the Blair class, if you like, the Blair government, was far more radical in a kind of Trotskyist vein. Well, I've said it, but I'm merely quoting other people. And one of Blair's closest political allies, Peter Hyman, has said that, uh, that Blairism was far more revolutionary than Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, an old friend of mine, who I can now name because he's no longer with us, Philip Bassett, who was for a long time an industrial correspondent for the Financial Times and the Times, who I knew quite well, told me we had a farewell lunch when he went off to work for the Blair machine. He said, you have no idea how extensive the, the Blair project is, the New Labour project is. And if you look carefully at the, 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 the origin of the most supposed Blair thought, the, the magazine Marxism Today, which is actually technically a Communist Party magazine, this was full of people who were, who, who were Marxists, post-1968 Marxists, who understood that the battles in the modern world were not about nationalizing the wealth industry or anything of that kind. They were about morality, they were about the family, they were about education, they were about controlling the television studio, not the barracks. They understood that the battle was to, was, was to obtain uh, power over the mind by, by cultural revolution and by changing the nature of society. And they've been extremely clever. And you look at them anyway, so many of them. Mm. Uh, Alice Darling, Alan Milburn, Stephen Byers, John Reed, Peter Mandelson, uh, Blair himself have 1960s Marxist backgrounds of one kind or another. You say, well, so do you, and I do, but here I am. Do you ever hear any other 60s Marxists say, I was one of those, I'm not any longer, mm. this is why I'm not? Mm. Most people who were in that wave of enthusiasm for revolution when they went into the world of work, they didn't fundamentally change their desire for revolution. They just became more subtle mm. about the kind of revolution they wanted. And as they moved upwards in the long march through the institutions, about 25 years after that was over, most of them were in, in positions of considerable influence, whether it be in the legal profession or the civil service or the police, or particularly in education and broadcasting and the media. And, and that had begun to show in a big way by 1997. Mm. And then in 1997, it obtained political power as well. And it was actually a revolutionary moment. Yes, it was it, it, far more so than you mentioned Dennis Healy in the 1970s, uh, who was a communist. But, but somehow there was something completely different about Labour then. Well, yes, but Healy was an ex-communist. Mm. He, 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 he crossed the Arthur Kirstler Bridge from, mm. from communism to social democracy. He'd actually given that stuff up. Uh, mm. But he still remembered the method. What, I, what I'm talking about here is someone like, John Reed, I fascinated once on the on the 
Today program on Radio 4, and just before I had the discussion on why the left should have been more pleased about how, how, how successful they'd been, they'd had an interview with John Reid. This was, he was a man who'd been in the Communist Party of Great Britain, who was now Defence Secretary. And he said during his interview, oh well, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And there was nobody in the studio who recognised, it's a quotation from Antonio Gramsci, the great thinker of behind all this, Euro, all this Euro-communism struggle for, for social and cultural power. They didn't even know it. And if you, if you hadn't had a Marxist training, again, you wouldn't spot it. But there you had a, a, defense, a British defense secretary, uh, more or less in charge of the nuclear deterrent, uh, quoting directly the words of an Italian Marxist of the 1930s. I didn't realize, actually, I, I know the quote, but I didn't realize it was Gramsci, actually. Well, there you go. Uh, there you go. Do, you, do you hold with the idea of the Long March being an utterly deliberate thing? Well, it's, you can't, it's, not, it's not so much deliberate as a... If you, if you have a, a generational upheaval at a certain time, then it will make itself felt. Mm. Uh, in, so, so, for instance, just to take for a parallel, say there had been in the, in the universities and the churches, as there was in the 19th century, a great revolution in the interpretation of Scripture, the view of, the, of, of, what, had, of what was actually authentic and what wasn't. 20 or 30 years later, uh, the whole nature of religious observance and belief in the societies where that happened had changed. Uh, because those people had 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 moved upwards from their from their early years into positions of importance, this is much wider, because this is about theories of of education, uh, of social organisation, of the family and marriage, of sexual relations, of all the things which are most intimate in our in our lives, and of course it was also. It was also hostile to the previous canon of what was thought to be good to know, uh, whether it be literature or history. And those things were changed. Universities may seem arcane and, and obscure places, but if the whole idea of what people think is good and important is altered in a generation, then the society in which that happens will change. Yes, yes. As did. Same happened in the United States. Actually, Speaking of the United States, there was um, recently governor of Florida, uh, Ron DeSantis, uh, called the, again, I'm going to quote, so let's, let's be quite clear about this. Um, he, he called critical race theory a race-based version of Marxist ideology. Now, in the context of what we're talking about, would you think that that is a, a fair definition? Uh, probably not. I, don't, I think I mean, it's, Marxism can be spread pretty thin and, and pretty widely, but I, I think th things like critical race theory are of, of their own, have their own origins. I mean, I can see why why a Marxist who was who wanted to use others to obtain his own ends might look at something like critical race theory and think it might be useful to him. But I, that I think it would be a bit of a stretch to find any point at which it meshes with the actual sayings and thoughts. Of Karl Marx. Mm, mm. What do you think when you look at what's been happening in America over the past six months or so, or actually for a long time, but as it is now, I'm astonished by the, what appears to be a transformation in the place. I, I, I'm afraid. I, I lived in the USA for, yeah. for two years under Bill Clinton. Mm. Uh, I, I learned a bit about it. I probably, as a result, know a little bit more about it than most British people, mm. but I really don't claim any expertise. And since uh, since then, I felt I've known less and less about it. And certainly in the in the in the the Tea Party and Trump era, I just felt that the country had taken a completely wrong turn and that if, if it had ever been any kind of arsenal of hope for conservatives it certainly wasn't now mm. conservatism had become completely mixed up with all kinds of things which weren't in my view really conservative mm. and so i'd look at american politics with um, mm. Mm. Uh, something close to despair and a lot of confusion but I, I really couldn't give you any kind of expert assessment of it i suppose it's always because uh, you know uh, we, there was always the view I had, you know, somehow if things got really sort of bad here, there was always America, you know, that the, the, it somehow was uh, Israel, if you like, it was a, a, our version of Israel. Um, but I don't feel this anymore. But. 
Well, you, one of the things about America is because, because it's, it is based fundamentally on a Republican revolution and was one of the 18th, great 18th century revolutions, its conservatism, so-called, is always going to be very different from mm. an English conservatism which ultimately rests on, on the crown and on the church. Uh, which in the United States it didn't. One of the fascinating things in the history of the United States, look at what happened in the years immediately after Yorktown uh, to those who had remained loyal to the crown. They were not tolerated. Mm. Uh, they were not uh, treated as reasonable opposition. They were, they, they, they were treated with considerable uh, savagery. And we owe the foundation of the Dominion of Canada as well to, uh, to, to, to the maltreatment of so many of the, of the, former, uh, the, 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 the former supporters of the British Crown who were more or less driven out. Mm. It, was, it, it was a genuine revolution. It had, it had social as well as national characteristics. And those, that lingers in, in the spirit and nature of the, of the United States as mm. a country. So if you're if you're a conservative like me, you don't. Well, there's a lot to like about the United States. There are a lot of things about it which are not mm. quite so appealing. When you look around the British scene at the moment, uh, do you see specifically sort of Marxist ideas in operation? Oh no, 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 no. There are very few people who would be who who would be equipped to to, to do that, but. It doesn't really matter very much that they that people are not specifically Marxist. If the things that they're pursuing are hostile to and destroy conservative institutions and thought, uh, what I do find—I mean, one of the things about about Marxism which I, I found fascinating again since 1968 and 1989—it's shifted away from the the priorities of the late 19th and early 20th century, which were fundamentally economic and about the ownership of means of production and, and class politics, and, and return very much to its origins, which really are in the, the, the 1792, three, the, the most radical part of the French Revolution. And these are social things. These are the dechristianization, the, the desecration of, of churches, the overthrow of former, uh, of former morality and rules, and a, a, a complete um, a complete utopianism, a desire to begin the world over again, in every aspect, and they're much, much broader and much more dangerous than than the cruder, narrow, Leninist form of Marxism, which could never, once it had taken power in in Russia and the Soviet Union, really get itself much beyond those limits. It wasn't that to do with Gramsci, wasn't it? it was no, well, that was before. Gramsci was one of the first European. Communists. He went to the Soviet Union, I think, in the twenties, and he came back and he said to his comrades in Italy, "This is a disaster. Uh, we will never get the the educated Christian working classes of Europe to accept this kind of government. Uh, it's uh, it's a millstone. Mm. We need a different approach. We need to capture. Uh, we need to find some other way of capturing the minds of those." We want to support our revolution. That was his cleverness. And in 1968, when the, when the only the only answer the Soviet Union had to the rather attractive radicalism of Alexander Dubček was tanks, an awful lot of intelligent left wing people, both in on both sides of the Iron Curtain, said, "Well, that's enough. This can't this can't continue." And that's why 1968 is still so important. Mm. Both sorts of uh, the, the radicals inside the Soviet Empire and outside the Rose, it couldn't go on like that. They had to turn in some other direction. And they did, and it's been very successful. Look around you and see how successful it is. Indeed. A lot of uh, younger people now, it appears, uh, who don't know very much about communist history, because they haven't been taught it, are receptive once again to these ideas. Of course they are. I mean, people, they, they, they believe that the world can be begun over again. It's, it's, uh, it's a normal thing for, for, for young, inexperienced people to think. And, it's, and without, so without the burden of having to defend the Soviet Union, it's easier to do. Mm. Many of them probably know rather little about the French Revolution. And if they knew more about it, they, they, would, they, they would see more and more reason to hesitate. Or some of the other radical outbreaks that there have been. 
But utopianism is, a, especially once religion has more or less died in a society, utopianism is to be expected and there will be people who embrace it over and over again. In every generation, utopianism either has to be defeated or endured. Interesting point actually you, you, you made there earlier, Peter, about going right back to the beginning, about the, you know, Russia, uh, Soviet Union disappearing meaning that in fact it gave a kind of good big boost to left wing thought. Well, the fall of the Berlin Wall liberated the left. Mm. They were the first people to escape. Mm. Some of the ideas that uh, we were talking about earlier before we came on air, but which were sort of informed by Marxism or a sense of equality, egalitarianism, which always sounds very benign, doesn't it? Um, but they sort of permeated at least it doesn't right. sound benign to me, actually. No, but, uh, well, actually, I, I remember so growing up, egalitarian, it, it was used in a, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a bad thing. I mean, it used to be used in argument as being a good thing. Um, certainly you, in terms of one of your particular uh, interests is education, what's happened in education. And uh, it was, absolutely went through the whole thing. You know, that it's about, you know, equality, essentially, of uh, opportunity, which is a great thing, but essentially, know, equality, it, it, did, it did not say on the banners of the French Republic, liberty, equality of opportunity, and fraternity. It said liberty, no. equality, <laughs> and fraternity. No, uh, there was nothing about opportunity at all. <laughs> no. uh, they, they weren't interested. Equality of opportunity is, is a very different thing from equality, and uh, conservatives use it as a as a sort of slogan to make out that they're in favour of well, they, that they're nicer. Uh, than you think they are, which is, I sp in, in most cases, true, because people think conservatives are so horrible it wouldn't be very difficult for them to be nicer than other people think they are. But equality of opportunity is not the equality that the left or any radical dreams of. It's equality of outcome that they want. Well, isn't that what we're having now? Well, I think it's what's being attempted. It, it will never happen. It never has. It never will. I mean, the, the, the Soviet Union, when, when I was there, was one of the most unequal societies I'd ever seen. It was a mm. special hospital the size of a major provincial city's general hospital behind a 12-foot wall in its own wood mm. on, in the Lenin Hills in Moscow, reserved entirely for members of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and nobody else could go there. Uh, special waiting rooms in airports and stations. I lived in this, let's say, this marvelous uh, nomenclatura block of flats with 12-foot ceilings and oak parquet floors and lovely views and no smell on the staircase, and that, uh, that wasn't available to anybody but the elite. A large number of my neighbors worked for the KGB. Uh, it, it was it, it, and there were the special hospitals. There was school number one in Moscow. Uh, one, at, one of my uh, translators and, 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 and fixers in Moscow, uh, a wonderful girl, Olga, who's, who's now left Russia, uh, she went to school number one in Moscow. Superb school, uh, English medium. Uh, which and it was the only her grandfather was a Red Army general, and uh, he who hated corruption and was a real Bolshevik. The only time he ever used his his pull, what they called blat, uh, in Soviet Moscow, was to get her into that school, because it was such a fantastic privilege. With uh, you, officially, of course, it was just like all the others. Yes, yes. Exactly. Officially, my flat was just like all the others. Right. I remember one day all my ration cards arrived. Uh, through the in, in in the post box, uh, Russian cup, so much vodka, so much tobacco, so much lard, whatever it was, it just came in because I was officially I was a normal Soviet citizen. I never dared collect the vodka ration. I thought if a foreigner had turned up in the vodka ration in that that period of Soviet history, I'd probably been lynched. Of all the places that you did travel, and and where you reported from, what state in your mind is being? Oh, no, that is the most important to me. Is there one? Sorry, what is what? what so you have to as a as a journalist when you were, you know, being a correspondent when you were in in Russia, or whatever. Where, which, what stands out as the most? Oh, well, living in, living in the Soviet Union changed my life. I mean, I'd, I'd known in the, I'd known in theory uh, all the things about it that I then found out in practice. Uh, but I I didn't know a lot of other things. I didn't know what one associates that secret police. Privation, queues, grayness, filth, air pollution, failure uh, in, in, in almost every aspect of everything. Uh, 
oppression, inability to travel, gloom. But what I didn't realize uh, was the huge hostility of the Soviet system f towards the married family and towards what we would regard as, as Christian morality that became evident to me. It was, it was all failing by the time I was there, but I, I'm pretty certain that at the time I was there, for instance, there were more abortions than live births mm. in the Soviet Union. Uh, I hardly knew any uh, Soviet person uh, of my age or anything around it who hadn't been through a divorce. Uh, it was almost universal. Uh, Childcare was, was basically a system whereby the state uh, didn't pay you enough for one parent to stay at home and, and raise the children, so both had to go out to work and could then take advantage of cheap childcare. Well, does this remind you of anything? Mm. Uh, but th th those aspects of it, uh, the social, cultural, familial, aspects of it and the deep hostility to religion which was just collapsing Gorbachev was bringing it to an end but which had been there very strongly until then was uh, was also an extraordinarily strong part of it they knew uh, that Christianity was a very strong rival to the sort of society they wanted to have and they weren't going to have any of it thank you very much do you think actually that Christianity therefore a religious belief is in fact the the most effective resistance to that form of totalitarianism. In other words, people often say, we have got to, for example, they say, we have got to utilize and protect enlightenment values against this. But in fact, you'd say Christianity is actually the only way. Well, it depends what you mean by resistance. I mean, the, the trouble with power of this kind is that it's almost impossible to resist. Uh, they crushed almost all resistance to everything they did for 70 years. In, it says people offering examples of, uh, of themselves of how one could live better, uh, then yes, but in terms of resistance, it's not, you're not going to overthrow uh, an iron-bound state like the Soviet Union by going to church or professing religious belief. No. No. You might as well try and overthrow it with poetry. It's not going to happen. No. Ultimately, what overthrew it was its failure to produce consumer goods. Mm. And whether the, the, the horror of China is that China is, is an equally hideous police state, but it can produce consumer goods. So it, it's, it's, it's proved that, uh, that what we used to think, that you couldn't have prosperity without freedom, uh, it's proved that isn't true. You, you, you can have prosperity and, and tyranny, and they've got it. I mentioned, uh, I was just mentioning a bit earlier, uh, education. And you were writing recently about uh, Shirley Williams, who was the former Labour Minister for Education in the 1970s, late 1970s, who you knew and... You well, I met her. I mean, she, I, when I was, a, a, oddly enough, a, a, an education reporter on the Daily Express back in the, the 70s, I met her for the first time and discovered that she was a delightful person uh, mm. and capable of disinterested kindness. I won't describe the incident where I discovered this in detail, but I have no doubt that, that it's true. She's a very likable person. Uh, and it's an interesting illustration to me of how much you can simultaneously like a person and think they're completely wrong. And also how maybe good people can do, can do bad, bad things. things. Yeah, they often yeah. can, yeah. I mean, I, I should explain to me, is that her name is synonymous with um, the introduction of comprehensive education, really, in, in, in Britain, isn't it? She was, she was deeply involved in it. I mean, she wasn't, uh, she, she believed it was a good thing, uh, there were two phases in which she was politically deeply involved in it. One, when she became, when Anthony Crossland, uh, he did have a predecessor, but doesn't, who doesn't really matter, when Anthony Crossland in 1965 began the process of destroying the selective secondary state education in the grammar schools. Uh, she, in 1967, became his minister for schools, so she was deeply involved in that very destructive process. She then stood for election in 1974 on a program of abolishing a particular type of grammar school called the Direct Grant School, mm. uh, which many of which were still remaining at the time. Uh, she she put that she she supported that election pledge while her own daughter Rebecca was attending such a school, Godolphin and, and Latimer in Hammersmith. Uh, and there's been some interesting correspondence in the Spectator lately about that particular incident. Uh, she, but she then went on to become education secretary in, I think, um, 70, 
76, I think, when Jim Callahan took over from Harold Wilson, she then was the the person who was in charge of uh, of abolishing the, the last remaining direct grants and getting rid of as, as many more grammar schools as she could do. So she, and she, to her dying day, she never expressed any regret over this. Mm. She continued to believe that the abolition of selective state secondary schools had benefited the poor, which I think is a, is a, is a demonstrably false belief. But she did, she did believe it. Well, yeah. So. He- it's this idea that somehow or other this brings about comprehensive education brings about social mobility it seems to be entirely uh, disproven. You know that it, I, I was grammar school boy, and I remember you know when my school went comprehensive, Shirley Williams was this kind of hate figure because she was symbolic of it. Um, but during that period, which was the seventies, was a period of great social mobility on the whole. You know. Uh, kids from grammar schools going to universities and things. That's ground to a halt pretty much, hasn't it? Well, yes, a lot of things, other things have changed. Uh, This was a much more class-riven society at that time than it is now. So it's different. What I would say is that it's it's, then the Sutton Trust has done some very interesting work on this, which it doesn't publicise very much because it's, the Sutton Trust isn't in favour of, of selection in state schools. But it has shown that the, the most uh, the most successful comprehensive schools tend to be the most socially selective, that is to say the biggest concentration of well-off pupils. Right. So it certainly, hasn't, it certainly hasn't created some kind of egalitarian paradise. Um, much more important to me is, the, is, is, and this is evident to anybody who studies the examination system in this country, is that the straightforward levels of secondary education have fallen so much uh, that even even judged by the rather low standards of, of good grades in a set of a central set of GCSEs, the, the the achievement of comprehensive schools in this country is only marginally higher than that of the remaining secondary moderns in areas where there are still grammar yeah. schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, and so basically, instead of creating grammar schools for all, which was the, the Labour Party pretend slogan, a bit like Marx and Spencer's exclusively for everyone rubbish, uh, instead of creating grammar schools for all, what the education system has created is secondary moderns for all. But I'd add to that, that uh, probably not as good as many of the secondary moderns, which were much smaller schools than comprehensive schools and so more disciplined, and also tended to teach people practical skills, which they tend not to do now. Yes. So the, the whole education system has been trashed uh, for anybody who isn't rich, and even the rich, the grammar schools and particularly the direct grant grammar schools, kept the private schools honest. Uh, they, their standards were extremely high. Mm. And once they'd gone, and once the grades had been telescoped and the whole levels had been reduced, any private school, pretty much, could claim to have fantastically high educational standards because it really doesn't take all that much uh, effort if you've got uh, a reasonable amount of, of discipline mm. and smaller classes. Uh, to to get your your pupils through uh, the lower grade exams we have now to look really good, but they haven't. They don't remotely approach the standards which they used to have before sixty five. And the the, the the history of the GCE GCE O level uh, is very interesting. It's first of all, it's it's the the lowering of its standards mm. and the telescoping of its grades. And then it's replacement by the totally different GCSE, which is a is an exam of a different character and nothing like as demanding. Tells you almost all you need to know about lowered standards. Well, yes, and also just the sheer number of A grades. Well, so it's just a tel- <laughs> telescoping of grades. Yes. You, you, yeah. you, you don't, people just didn't get uh, even A grades or grade ones or whatever the equivalent were in, in the in the early sixties in in anything like the numbers they do now. They were quite rare. Same with universities, which which were a first class degree was a really quite a hard thing to get. Whereas now they are, I won't say they come up with the rations, but they're much more easily obtained than they were forty years ago. Do you think there would ever be a time where widespread selective education could make a return? Well, it has done in in Germany. The when the East German communist regime fell in nineteen eighty nine, and East Germany was almost wholly comprehensive. Uh, they had one very good elite school in Germany, the Karl von Ossietzky uh, Weister Oberschüler. Uh, the, there was a great deal of petitioning in all the new states of the new East Germany for the return of 
of grammar schools and of gymnasium, as they call them. And I've been to um, to one of them in uh, Wismar in the Baltic. Uh, it's exactly what you what you want there. I was I spent a day with the English class, and the, the pupils were a mixture of the children of dockers and doctors. It, it was exactly yeah. what you want. There was no mm. there was no. It wasn't a class based school. It was an achievement and standards based school. And I say they've they've got the back. Uh, I think I think in all the, in all the states of East Germany, so you you can you can bring them back if you want to. So it could be done. I think the 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 fact that the the private schools in this country are rapidly becoming so expensive that only mm. Russian oligarchs can afford to send their children to them is going to mean that the middle class of this country is going to be much more interested in the standards of state schools, uh, much more closely interested in the coming years. Uh, but at the moment, everything has to be seen through this great impenetrable fog of the academies. Mm. It's almost impossible to tell from outside whether they're as good as they claim to be. But does Germany have the same sort of educational blob, as they call it, as we do here? I don't believe so. I, I, education in Germany is run by the states rather than by the central government, and it does mm. vary from state to state. In some of the, of the more left-wing states, they've got a mixture of comprehensive and selective education. Mm. Uh, in Bavaria, the, generally the, the gymnasium, the, the grammar schools are supposed to be better than most of the rest of the country. It varies. Uh, but most, I think, of the German-speaking countries in Europe, uh, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, have still retain uh, some sort of selection. Though they don't use an 11-plus examination, they tend to use assessment. Mm. Uh, and they have something approaching the tripartite system, which we attempted to build in 1944, and never really did. Mm. Okay. Um, I have to ask, well, I don't have to ask, so I want to ask, uh, as we sort of, this is we're in the beginning of May, we've got about a, a, a month left, month and a half left, before the country is supposedly opening up, you know. Um, I mean, you've been talking very consistently right throughout this whole uh, period, this past year. What are your general f feelings about Britain as we enter our supposed the end of the whole pandemic thing. I, you know, have you, I know you're pretty pessimistic about Britain, but do you think that um, we have actually permanently given away rights and freedoms now? Well, rights and freedoms is the wrong way of putting it. And you know, these are, I, I, free, freedoms are a different thing from rights. So it should be distinguished from the rights mm. are more or less things invented by yeah. the state, uh, which are then handed to us as things which the state has codified. Freedoms are things which existed uh, in, in all times, uh, which we had and which have to some extent been taken away from us by the state or surrendered to the state. I would say you look at the history of the, of the 20th century in this country, you see a, a, long, a long tally of freedoms being handed over uh, by the people to the state, particularly during wartime, uh, which were to a great extent not handed back. But they don't tend to be codified as you can't do this, you can't do that. They, it, what happens is that people become more used to seeking government approval for something that they do uh, and more used to the idea that what they do is controlled by somebody else and regulated. And, and, and the assumption which existed largely in this country until before, just before 1914, that really the state had very little business in your life has gone. We just, we just assume that we are, we will be governed and told what to do by a stronger and stronger state. And I think the state grew a lot stronger during the period of the, of, of the shutdowns because the, the civil society and the people in general uh, showed so little spirit in defense of those freedoms which they still had. Mm. I think that's a permanent effect. People, once people have, have, have ceased to act like free men, they ceased to be free men. And I think mm. people didn't act like free men and women during that period. Mm. So, in fact, it, we are diminished. I think so. I think you can get into the habit of, of, of being more of a serf than you were before, and I think that's what we did. Mm. I look at the mask wearing, for instance, and people they're wearing in the street. Mm. Nobody even says that you should do that. No one has ever said, actually, no. that you need to do no. that. Mm. But they do it. Mm. Mm. And in many cases, they look askance at those who don't. Mm. Speaking as one who doesn't wear a mask in the street, you, know, you notice that people well, will you go, go, a... go round you. Uh, <laughs> You did wear a gas mask. I, I, was, like... I was taking what is politely called the mickey uh, <laughs> when 
I did that. You you've had the vaccination, didn't you? You've had the. I had the first one. Yeah, yeah, I had the first one. Um, so you had that wasn't part of what you were considered to be. I had it? never uh, said anything about vaccination. Mm. No, no. I hadn't said I wouldn't get it. I hadn't said other people should get it. A lot of people who feel very strongly about it, and it's a perfectly legitimate position to hold, got angry with me because I had done what they didn't want to do, which seems to me and still seems to me to be completely unreasonable. But mm. I, people get unreasonable under these circumstances. It's, mm. I suppose they're entitled to. I just, but it's just, it just, it's never been the thing which has particularly troubled me. Well, no, it's, it seems to be quite distinct from what we were talking about with freedoms. I, mean, I think so. It I mean, I guess it, it, was, it, it, it was, in my case, it was a, it was a practical choice with mm. particular personal reasons to it, but I, you know, which I'm, I, I could make life a lot easier for myself if I specified exactly what they were. But I'm damned if I'm going to go into that much detail of my private life in public. Mm. Well, look, um, thank you once again and um, for coming on. And... Uh, I hope you'll join us in another six months, Peter. Well, I look forward to it if we're not if we're not algorithmed out of existence <laughs> between now and then. I can't see why they would possibly have a go at this one. Um, but I'm Because I'm, I'm on it. Yes. <laughs> there we are. I'm taking the risk. Anyway, uh, thanks very much, Peter. Thanks yeah, a lot. Thank you. Um, that's it for so what they're saying is. Um, and we shall see you next time. Thank you.